and welcome to this week's lecture on Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. In this uh, lecture, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the historical and literary context uh, that are associated with this uh, Gothic novel. We look at um, the romantics as well uh, as a philosophy uh, very briefly and we will um, take a, a quick look at some discussion questions as well now uh, the key historical events um, that are associated with the gothic uh, novel and its rise are these um, 1789 is considered um, to be the start of the French Revolution and it is an attempt of the French people to rid themselves of their absolute monarchy. So it is a kind of a radical political struggle which is uh, seeking a lot of um, drastic change uh, to the way uh, the society is run. British liberals were excited that the common people were standing up to their oppressors but they quickly became disillusioned when the revolution became very bloody and its leaders became tyrants themselves. So across the English Channel, Great Britain uh, and its liberals particularly were excited by the prospect that um, things are going to change for the better uh, for the oppressed people but then they became um, very disillusioned. The romantics particularly became disillusioned when uh, the revolution became extremely violent and um, the so-called leaders were uh, becoming uh, tyrants and dictators themselves. The dates, um, if you look at uh, the year 1793 to 1794, there was this reign of terror under Robespierre which was unleashed on the uh, country. British liberals lost all hope for true justice and equality in that, in that year. So, the kind of idealism that was associated with the revolution was shattered uh, um, uh, for the uh, uh, romantics, especially the English romantics. Um, 1804 uh, saw the crowning uh, of Napoleon as the emperor of France. So all these um, uh, dates are interesting and significant because um, we somehow associate uh, um, the idea of terror that is depicted in the early Gothic fiction to the terror unleashed, um, you know, during the French uh, Revolution. So some of the complications and complexities associated uh, with the political um, ideals are kind of subtly connected with the rise of this kind of uh, literary um, subgenre, which we call uh, the Gothic. Now. Um, the romantic writers were turning towards nature as an escape from the harsh realities of their world. Nature was some place where human tyranny did not reign. Um, so this nature worship is crucial both for the romantics as well as for the gothic um, narrative. Uh, we, we can see a lot of extensive descriptions of nature in gothic fiction and um, nature seems uh, a haven as well as uh, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a discourse, a topic, and a, an entity which can uh, provoke ideas of sublimity um, in the person who is um, appreciating, enjoying, um, enjoying these elements of nature. Now, um, the idea is that the subject of nature is common to both the romantics as well as the gothic uh, uh, writers, which is why uh, we are discussing um, the romantics here uh, and, and the connection with uh, the gothic novel is something that we should be aware of. The romantics uh, were for the most part disheartened liberals um, and, and we saw how, uh, you know, during the French Revolution, um, you know, the ideals of the revolution were shattered by the um, uh, leaders who led the revolution. And this kind of um, disheartened the uh, liberals who were uh, watching the progression of the revolution. So there is a close connection between um, the French Revolution, the Romantics and the Gothic uh, writers. Uh, of course, the Gothic kind of developed into something else as, as it was kind of a written and adapted and reshaped and, and, and continued to be, um, you know, uh, you know, accommodated um, in various ways in, in different centuries. Um, so, but but the the essential idea of reacting to oppression in a particular way uh, is, is a, a trajectory that continues to be one of the characteristics of Gothic fiction. Now, to get back to uh, the idea of nature, uh, the uh, romantics sought solitude in nature. 
believing that the key to all emotional healing could be found in uh, nature. Nature imagery is the most predominant feature of romantic uh, literature. So uh, the idea of um, isolation, um, you know, finding uh, peace in solitude, um, especially in the lap of nature, is something that is very, very strong uh, in romantic literature. You can think about Wordsworth, um, you know, Shelley, Keats, and um, you, the, the representation of nature is, is varied, and, and uh, they all have a common theme of nature being somehow um, uh, somehow a spirit that guides humanity that kind of uh, you know uh, keeps the humans um, you know uh, company in in various ways so nature imagery is is a very prominent feature of romantic literature of course the, the representation of nature in, in Wordsworth is different to the representation of nature in uh, say for example um, uh, Shelley but but we do understand that nature is a, a strong spirit which which kind of um, walks hand in hand with other uh, uh, human races. The idea of uh, the disenfranchised man is also a common uh, principle that is treated in uh, romantic literature. So uh, it's a common topic, a common subject. Uh, so such men, um, the unfree men, the disenfranchised means somebody who is in chains uh, uh, metaphorically. And um, this uh, figure, the disenfranchised or the chained man, uh, finds himself unable to live in society and this figure was usually sympathized with a lot uh, and almost revered in romantic literature. So this um, figure is something we need to keep in mind when we also talk about um, the gothic novel where we find similar figures who are um, bound literally and metaphorically. With reference to Frankenstein, um, the disenfranchised men refer to two figures, both Frankenstein and his creation, and they're both disenfranchised, both chained in some ways. Uh, the creature, the monster, because his form keeps him from any human company, um, he is bound because of its very nature. The creature is so horrifying to look at, so hideous. Um, so unlike his, um, you know, compatriots, so unlike the rest of society that he cannot relate to, one, um, you know, anybody else. So he is chained by the very fact of his being. And Frankenstein, the creator, the scientist, is also chained because he feels, he eventually feels that he cannot enjoy the company of his fellow man uh, because of what he did um, through his experiments. Because he created a monster and let it loose, um, loose among society, he's unable to um, have any kind of rapport with the rest of society, or with his own family, because of the complications which arise um, from the acts of the monster. For example, um, you know, uh, this monster literally and, and metaphorically kills companions um, that Frankenstein could have had. He kills off um, Elspeth, um, who, who could have been his wife. He kills off his friend. So he kills his brother. The father of Frankenstein dies because of these kind of miseries. So you can, you can see how the monster is kind of eliminating his relations and his connections with society in a very literal uh, manner. So these are some of the uh, ideas that we can think about in relation to um, the disenfranchised man, a concept that uh, is treated very much in romantic literature and which does get uh, treated in different ways in Gothic fiction. So you can see how um, the Gothic is connected to the romantic um, uh, narrative in these ways nature being one, um, the idea of the disenfranchised man. In terms of nature, you can also think about how nature gets represented in uh, the mysteries of Udolfo, Emily St. Aubert, Valancourt, um, St. Aubert, everybody, uh, they kind of appreciate uh, nature. There is an element of the picturesque uh, painted in words on the pages of the novel in Frankenstein, we can see how the Arctic ways are beautifully uh, described by uh, the author. So uh, how do we see Gothic literature? And Gothic literature is an offshoot, is a branch of romantic literature, but then um, over the course of time, it has come um, into its own, it has its own um, 
body of writing across the globe so it has become a kind of an independent uh, uh, domain of literature uh, but gothic does put a spin on the romantic idea of nature worship and nature imagery um, as i have uh, been discussing so far one of the uh, ways in which you can explore the theme of nature in gothic fiction is to kind of um, perceive how uh, com comprehend how um, you know nature is represented and to what effect what are the functions of nature um, that is uh, used in a particular novel what effect does um, say for ha for example uh, the representation of nature have on Emily St. Aubert in um, The Mysteries of Udolfo what is the role of um, nature in Frankenstein what effect does it have on the monster on uh, Frankenstein and, and on other characters so these are some of the ways in which you, you can try to kind of uh, seek the purpose of nature in gothic fiction now mood is also connected to um, the ambience the setting uh, the physical setting as well so the most common feature of gothic literature is the indication of mood through weather when bad things are going to happen in a gothic novel the reader knows it because there is inevitably a storm outside so um, the storm uh, is particularly uh, you know uh, easy for us to kind of understand the relationship between um, you know the external weather and the internal mood of the uh, novel so when things are uh, going to take a turn for the worse in a novel uh, you can see the writer making that kind of um, foreshadowing transparent by having a storm a really wild uh, night um, uh, happen in a particular uh, moment in the novel so um, that kind of connection is something that we have read over the course of literature you can you can think about Shakespeare's King Lear where uh, when Lear is wandering on the meadows um, you know uh, cut off from the rest of his family uh, you know there's a big raging storm outside and he's caught in the storm so the internal um, turbulence of Lear is is kind of uh, reflected externally through that wild storm likewise in a gothic novel when uh, things start uh, you know uh, uh, when things are going to get ugly uh, nature itself is wild and turbulent and stormy as we have discussed uh, earlier the idea of storm is used to kind of set up the appear uh, set up the appearance of um, the monster so when frankenstein is about to encounter his creature in the mountains we, we can see the storm kind of raging uh, and uh, frankenstein um, quits his seat uh, this is a quote from the novel um, i quitted my seat and walked on although the darkness and storm increased every minute and thunder burst with a terrific crash over my head Vivid flashes of lightning uh, dazzled my eyes, illuminating the lake, making it appear like a vast sheet of fire. I perceived in the gloom a figure which stole from behind a clump of trees near me. I stood fixed, gazing, gazing intently. A flash of lightning illuminated the object and discovered its shape plainly to me. Its gigantic stature uh, and deformity of its aspect, more hideous than it belongs to humanity. So you can see how... Um, the appearance of the na uh, of, of the creature is connected to the appearance of a monstrous um, character of nature uh, so thunder and lightning um, happens and then um, and, and thunder and lightning is also used to kind of illuminate um, the the nature and character of the monster um, and it's gigantic just as nature is kind of boundless and massive and um, lightning kind of uh, you know uh, lightens up um, the, the physique of the monster for Frankenstein's book, uh, for Frankenstein as well as for us, the readers, and we see it as we, um, you know, we, we, we are seeing it with uh, Frankenstein, the monster that he has created, and uh, he says that it's more hideous, uh, it, it's extremely hideous, it's deformed, and it, it's unlike uh, the human uh, race. So, um, both the mood and, and the dramatic uh, nature of the story is uh, enhanced by this um, setup of the storm. Now, when we're talking about uh, the idea of nature, we're talking about the idea of the rural life um, and how um, ideal life in nature becomes, we also need to focus on um, the set of characters called the Delacy's in Frankenstein. So these figures are cottagers and Frankenstein uh, 
lives for almost a year uh, in a hovel um, near the Delacy's. And these figures are important because they teach him how to kind of live a life very simply. And um, Frankenstein looks at this family and kind of envies um, the love that's there in that family, the compassion. And he also tries to help them out, um, you know, very subtly without letting them know um, for a great uh, part of his life, um, you know, which he spends with the Delacy's. So this set of characters are important because it idealizes the idyllic life, um, the life spent in um, simplicity, in close association with uh, nature. So the creature spends a year living in a hovel adjoined to the Delacy cottage and he watches the family and the family has a blind patriarch and he has a daughter Agatha, son Felix and uh, Felix, Felix's fiance Safi and he kind of uh, watches them through a chink in the wall and from the Delacy's the creature learns um, familiar love, love that is found in a family and most important language he learns to speak by looking at the speech of these um, cottages. Eventually, he decides that this loving family in the cottage might be his best opportunity for a sanctuary within the cruel world. One day, while Agatha, Felix, and Safi are out, he enters the cottage and introduces himself to the patriarch, begging him for help and friendship. Just as Delacy con uh, concludes, I am blind and cannot judge of your countenance, but there is something in your words which persuades me that you are sincere and his children return. Felix pulls the creature from his father's legs and beats him with a stick, all without having heard the creature utter a word, responding solely to his appearance. So we have a poignant scene in the story. So the cottages are the means through which the creature learns how to speak so he can tell a story and how to socialize. They're the single most important factor in making the creature long for human company and then his feeling for utter despair. Uh, that drives him to murder. So th there are extremes of uh, emotion provoked by this particular set of people. On the one hand, they uh, make uh, Frankenstein long to have a family of his own. They they make Frankenstein want to socialize, want to love. Uh, but at the same time, when he's rejected, um, you know, from this family, by this family, uh, he becomes utterly, uh, you know, uh, full of despair and he wants to kind of wreak vengeance on a society. So as I said, the cottage the very word the cottages is an important um, element of the romantic moment. Um, the cottage becomes idealized in the poetry of um, Wordsworth. They become people with the best, um, you know, uh, generosity, the most compassion, and, and they, they are ideals. Um, but in this novel, uh, you know, you can see a different side to that kind of idealism when uh, he's kicked out by Felix, um, who is trying to protect his father because he hasn't heard um, Frank, uh, he, because he, he hasn't heard uh, Frankenstein's creature uh, speak, um, speak, um, you know, to his father. So he kind of tries to um, save his father when he when he sees him kneeling by the side of his father. Now there are uh, a few questions that you might want to think about in relation to Frankenstein. Um, the novel, you can analyze the character development of Victor Frankenstein and the creature. Um, you can trace the uh, trajectory of uh, Frankenstein from his um, childhood to uh, the moment where he chases um, the, the monster that he has created. So you can do a kind of an analysis of all the motivations that drive him to uh, be the man that he is. And you can also do a character sketch of the creature uh, and talk about um, how the creature changes um, by, by um, you know, uh, through his interactions with society, how he initially longs for uh, Frankenstein's attention and then how he kind of is repelled constantly and then he seeks vengeance. So these are some of the uh, things that you can keep in mind. You can also think about the use of the other characters. What function do they serve uh, in this uh, novel? You can think about uh, Robert Walton, um, his silent sister. You can think about uh, Henry, uh, Frankenstein's uh, best friend, okay, Elizabeth, and so on. And you can um, kind of sketch out um, their function within the novel. Um, you can also compare and contrast Frankenstein, the novel, to Paradise Lost, the work by Milton, and other works of literature, uh, perhaps Dracula and other gothic fiction as well so you can see what how gothic um this novel is and how different it is to the other works uh, um, that you find uh, across the period
You can also uh, identify and analyze the various literary devices such as foreshadowing, suspense, exposition, climax, and foils. Um, foreshadowing is a very key motif, a uh, gothic motif. Suspense and ex suspense is also a motif of gothic fiction. Then you, you can see how the exposition is set up. Uh, the climax is, um, you know, illustrated for the reader and foils. You know, Frankenstein is a foil for Robert Walton. Uh, Frankenstein is a foil for the creature himself. So you can see how, um, you know, doubling is used in Gothic fiction, uh, how doubles perform and function in the novel. So um, that kind of duality is interesting to explore too. Uh, you can uh, understand the significance of the subtitle, The Modern Prometheus. The modern Prometheus uh, kind of links this novel to the idea of the Promethean legend and how Prometheus the Titan stole fire from the gods and uh, you can connect it to Frankenstein and to Robert Walton. Are they being saviors to humanity? Does their enterprise um, uh, succeed? If it doesn't succeed, why does it uh, not succeed? What are the implications uh, of this kind of uh, failures uh, for um, you know, uh, the rest of society? How does uh, the novel kind of uh, uh, assess um, the, the triumphs uh, that are happening in society in relation to science? Um, and and uh, why is the novel uh, not trying to appreciate science in this way? Um, so these are some of the questions you might think about. And you can also um, finally debate the culpability of the two main characters arguing both sides of the issue. So the two main characters would be Frankenstein, the father, and uh, the monster created by Frankenstein. You can argue, um, you know, uh, the righteousness or the, or the evil nature of their actions uh, and, and see how justified they are in what they have done. Thank you for watching. I'll continue in the next session.